We have to know what they love so that we can take it away. You are mean. <laughs> Sounds like the meanest mother ever. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to the Maven Parent Podcast. We are on episode 526 on discipline. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I think it's episode five, but we are going through a series on big worldview question on discipline. What does it look like as Christian parents to have a Christian worldview on discipline? So that's what we're going through. And today we're going to get I'm uh, more into the practical and especially focus on the younger years. Um, and this is a topic um, actually that we've been doing on the podcast, but we just uh, spoke at a church this past weekend, Brett and I, and we one of the talks was on this topic. So it seems to just be one that we are continuing to uh, work out our sanctification in. <laughs> yeah. You just kind of you kind of just glossed over that that we did this event together, but that was that was a big deal. That was our one of our that was like our first time doing a major kind of seminar together co-teaching, which was quite the challenge to yes. be on stage teaching together. I think this podcast has maybe helped prepare you for that. <laughs> uh, I mean prepare us us right. for that. Uh, but no, we, we did talk about these three revolutions trying to equip mm -hmm. parents, grandparents, youth workers, really any stakeholder in the life of young kids, um, trying to prepare them to deal with these revolutions. Mm -hmm. And one of them is a revolution in authority. And that's, yeah. that's why this topic is so vital. And that's why we have been spending so much time on it. So uh, I hope as you've been listening through this that you 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 you're able to see where we're going and why so you know and, and therefore why we're doing this. But if you can't see it, then let me help you. Um, let me do a little review because what we want to do, want to do in the next 527 <laughs> shows on discipline <laughs> is get to all the practical stuff. Uh, so here's where we've we, we we've kind of started. We we've, we've said, look, uh, as, as followers of Jesus, right, we ought to have a Christian worldview, which is, uh, you know, sometimes we'll refer to it as a biblical worldview. It's the idea that the, the scriptures give us knowledge of reality, and therefore everything in life is seen through that picture and then acted upon from those convictions, those assumptions, that Christian worldview. And so when we come to a particular issue like discipline, that's where we first want to, that, that's, that's our starting point, is the Christian worldview and what the Christian worldview says about the nature of reality. So that is the, the big framework here. And I don't think, I don't think we've seen really any resources out there that talk about maybe discipline in, in, in these kind of things. Like, can you think of a, a resource that's out there, a book or a? Um, not, I mean, not offhand. Not, of not like we we're talking about it. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, there could be stuff out that they're well, not aware of. There certainly could be. It's possible. It's, it's, a, it's a mere possibility. Yeah. But it's definitely not the majority of stuff out yeah, there. Yeah, it seems like and most of the resources come at it from... Or, or talk about just a certain aspect of it or something. Or, or it's like, very pragmatic or very overly pragmatic. practical. Yeah. I mean, what I was trying to position our podcast here is in this <laughs> unique space. And you're just undermining me. And I'm just me. saying, well, no, it doesn't have to No one has ever done anything like this. <laughs> well, actually, I think there's quite a few. There, I mean, it's possible. <laughs> anyway, uh, we may have to agree to disagree <laughs> on this, but I think this is utterly unique uh, material. So, no, but it is, it is really in terms of parenting books and resources out there. But so we started with some good Christian thinking, looking at how discipline really starts with our Christian worldview. It starts with God's existence and God's design for humanity. And, you know, what is this, this overarching purpose 
for mankind. But we were created for God and we were created for uh, fellowship with him and we were created to glorify him. And so discipline is, is something that leads us back to God. Uh, then defining discipline, the way we define discipline very simply was it's training that corrects. It corrects us morally, and that correction uh, helps develop in us these good habits. We talked about habits that it develops, like unselfishness and, and those kind of things, that end up being these, these things uh, in our lives, virtues, character traits, that help us to flourish as human beings. So when we look at discipline, starts with God. We, I mean, we also uh, look at you know what it means to be human, image of God stuff, and then you know that's where correction and training fits in. Uh, fallenness of man, we're fallen, so you know we're dignified, and yet we're also broken and rebellious. So then, tr- this training that corrects brings us back to God relates us properly to him, helps us to learn how to submit to him, and then helps us also to flourish because we are actually designed to live uh, virtuously with character, you know, with you know, these the fruits of the spirit. So all of that gives us that larger picture that makes sense. And when we begin with the end in mind, that's a phrase we use a lot on this podcast when it comes to parenting is always beginning with the end of mind meaning the end in mind with what we want, this larger vision for our kids. And in terms of discipline, looking at a hey, kind of character and virtue over success. That was one of you know the, the podcasts we did in this discipline series. So all of that is just a little bit of review to help us frame and understand a Christian worldview when it comes to discipline. And now I think that helps us to step forward here after some good, careful thinking, to now get to the practical stuff. And once I think we have that Christian worldview in place, one of the huge benefits is that it motivates us. It motivates us to do this practical stuff. It actually helps us figure out, okay, what are the practical things we need to do? What fits with what it means to be human when it comes to discipline? And then uh, it also gives us the courage to do this stuff. Yeah, that's what I was thinking it gives. I know for me, as we've, um, you know, journeyed as parents for 26 years now, I think I know the more I've studied and learned and and kind of made sense of all of this from a Christian worldview, it's given me the confidence that I've needed at times where it's been, and I guess courage, confidence, you could use either one, but to do the hard things when I don't want to do it um, or to, yeah, just to help me persevere through the hard things. And even the nights where you're in bed and thinking, you know, did I screw up? Did, you know, should I have done this? Should I have done that? And of course, there's always times where, yeah, you should have done <laughs> something different. But, um, but this Keeping the end in mind helps you to, okay, I've made a mistake. So tomorrow I get up, I might need to ask for forgiveness. Um, I might need to shift how I've done it. I might need to go actually now and implement a consequence for something that I let go, you know, whatever. So it just gives, it's given me the courage to do the hard things when I've needed to, which is, it's been a, that's a big deal. I feel like for me just to have courage to do the right thing. Yeah. And, and I and I think that what, everything that you said there uh, helps us to see how over the long term, thinking carefully about this stuff fuels our action. Mm-hmm. Because it's not just about, okay, what's the step I can take now? Mm-hmm. But, um, but the careful thinking is this fuel, maybe, maybe that's a good analogy. It's this fuel that we put into the engine that over time allows us to kind of, yeah, uh, go the distance. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and so one of the things that we, we talked about in defining discipline from a Christian worldview, biblically, is that it's training that corrects, mm-hmm. and that helps us to, to, to properly f- think about discipline itself, that it, it's not just punishing your kid because yeah. that's what we often think about when it comes to discipline is you think discipline, you think 
just naturally, oh, punishment. Yeah, that, that has to do with punishment and, you know, whatever those pu- punishment measures are that we take. But that's essentially what discipline turns out to be. Mm-hmm. But that's not what it is. It's training to correct. Yeah. And using words like training and words like habits, I think, are words we should use when we think about discipline, because that will help us to have to maintain this fuller picture this bigger worldview of what discipline is. So we don't just think of discipline as punishment to shame our children or something like that, you know, this condemnation or whatever, just always thinking about discipline as the time when you're spanking or time out or that's what we go to. And we have to resist that because it discipline is so much bigger. Of course, keeping the long-term goals in mind and then also just how we think about it, um, in how we execute it, it includes the good too. It's not just the hard. So I was talking about courage to do the good. So I think, you know, there's a few things, um, from a few steps, I think that we can take when we start in our discipline with our kids that help us to, um, remember that it is a big, a big worldview picture and it's not just about punishment. And so one of those um, out of the four that we came up with is just to have reasonable expectations. So when we are training and habit forming our children, that we have reasonable expectations for what that means. So uh, for one thing, I think when we think about discipline, it actually starts earlier than we think. And so expectation wise, I think as parents, we need to start to think about this habit training, even when they're babies. And that seems crazy, like disciplined babies. Okay. I'm not talking about punishing babies. So again, make that shift, but about training and even when they're babies. And so Um, you know, I remember our son, Micah, when he was like seven months old, crawling over to the bookshelf and starting to pull all the books on the floor. Which in our house is, I mean, that's one of the, the, the biggest rules (laughs) that you can violate. (laughs) You touch a book and you're not supposed to touch a book. There's huge punishment that's coming your way because books are sacred in this home. (laughs) So yes, he went over and touched our sacred books. And so I, you know, I picked up Micah, I pulled him away, I sat him down and I said, no, Micah. And then he looked right at me, crawled, you know, he's just crawling, crawls right back and starts pulling him down again. And so I pull him away again and say, no, Micah. And he looked at me and went, Ugh. And crawled right didn't, didn't back to the- Didn't he ball his fist? Didn't he go like, <laughs> I think like he did. This. He did like to do that. It was a clear illustration that uh, that 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 when you bring home a little child, you're bringing home this bundle of depravity, mm-hmm. of sinfulness, <laughs> right? I mean, yes. no one had to, no one, no, you know, we we're not actively teaching Micah uh, right, to rebel. Yeah. It just comes natural yes. to human beings. This yes. is why we got to start with the proper view of human nature. And, and our son Micah actually really struggled with I think his <laughs> depravity. <laughs> as he sits behind the camera and (laughs) listens. So I think, you know, that was one of those moments going back to that story of where it was clear he already was developing this will to do what he wanted to do. And clearly I was stopping him from doing that. Okay. But, but I had to stop him. You know, this wasn't something we were going to let him do. So Now, of course, when they're babies, it's just this gentle correction, right? And then when they're babies too, you you distract them. So eventually I just picked up Micah. We went to the room with the toys and I distracted him. But But it's just even that mindset of, oh, this correction, this training that we don't throw books on the ground, that we don't throw our food, you know, things like, like discipline will happen in the high chair, you know, and I think... Sometimes we we don't think it we think it starts later on, but it actually does start earlier where we're just training them. No, don't scream. Do you want more Cheerios? Say please, even when they can't say please. But you're talking calmly. 
no screaming, you know, and so you're mo- you're even starting to model and train what your expectations are with them, even when they're little and you know, they're not necessarily going to stop the first time. Like with Micah, I knew the book thing was going to be a repeated thing. So it's not like I have an expectation. He's going to be three. He's can understand what a three-year-old can. And and in the same way, you know, with, we just have the healthy expectations that, for example, toddlers are going to be very curious. And so they're going to want to open cupboards and pull out everything and, you know, dump out the cereal box and put their hands on something hot or get in the water and make a whole mess. You know, these types of things. So it's that we have reasonable expectations And don't put them in situations that are, you know, they're not able to handle at their age. Okay. Let me, let me pause you here. Okay. So, so this first kind of step that really helps us think of discipline more is that corrective training versus just punishment is having reasonable expectations. And you've mentioned some specifics, right? So uh, it starts early. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I guess what are, I, I'm just thinking about a parent out there. Okay. That's a, this is a broad statement. Have reasonable expectations. Where do we get those, you know, where do we get those reasonable expectations from? How do I know whether or not my expectations are reasonable? How, you know, how do we help parents kind of answer that question? Mm-hmm. Cause I think, you know, well, you know, obviously we're, well, not necessarily obviously, but we're on the same page with this, that. Okay, it it starts early. So this, especially when you think when you realize it's not just punishment. Mm -hmm. So hey, yeah, oh, the correct and correction started back when Micah was six or seven months, and you're training to correct. So that so that's a reasonable expectation based upon what discipline is. Uh, You, I think you mentioned what was the other uh, expectation? Um, The toddler. Yeah, there was something else I think you just mentioned that was an expectation. I uh, can't remember. I mean, you just said it. Oh, that they're curious, five minutes ago. that toddlers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was it. So that there's, hey, not everything a kid does is out of rebellion. Yeah. Sometimes it's just natural curiosity. Yeah. Okay. So I'm. Uh, h- how do we help parents figure out what those reasonable expectations are? What are those? I mean, do we have some exhaustive list? <laughs> no. I mean... It's anything I think from like reading stuff about, you know, stages of kids and stuff like that. But I also I think, too, it's it's we know we kind of know our kids and and we're learning about them as they respond. So, for example, the baby analogy, you know, people think that you can't, you know, stop a baby from like throwing their food or doing something or screaming at the top of their lungs. But. I think we know that that's false because an parent can learn that because when you when you give them something they want, you see that they're able to control their emotions because they'll stop on a dime. So, for example, like, you know, you're they'll a parent will say, you know, I can't stop my kid from throwing timber tantrums or something. But then I'll say to them, well, have you ever, you know, been in a situation and then you hand them something they want and they immediately stop and they'll say, oh, yeah, I, I, you know, I gave them this or their pacifier or whatever it was. And so I say, OK, so see, they they can control it. And it's just you gave them what they wanted or what, you know, whatever it was. But that is for parents shows you, oh, they can actually control themselves. So it's learning about your kid in that way, I think, of just watching them and seeing what they're capable of. And so. You know, you don't have to just keep giving in to the screaming baby. You can hold something away, say no, no more, and and they'll learn, oh, I don't get that. You know, that's how they start making these connections. So it's, of course, spending time with them, but actually it leads well to our our second step, which is well, knowing we, your kids. Before you go there. Okay. I, so I just want to summarize, I think, for for parents who are listening, especially for newer parents Mm -hmm. who feel like they're just trying to figure this out. And then we're throwing out, Hey, I have reasonable expectations. And they're like, I don't know what reasonable (laughs) expectations are, you know, and how do I figure that out? Well, I think what you said is, 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 is true and correct, right? Part of it's through experience. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so sometimes you learn that and sometimes you have to correct as you go. You realize, oh, this was an unreasonable expert expectation or uh, I didn't have a high enough expectation. So you learn that through experience. You make plenty of mistakes. You need to give yourself grace as a parent. I mean, I've had to give you a lot of grace in this process, Aaron, as I've raised you as well. Yeah. Um, You're so generous. <laughs> uh, no, we've had to give each other grace. We've had to give ourselves grace because you're, you're kind of, especially when you're a young parent or a parent of young kids or, you know, first time parent or whatever, you're, you're just figuring it out. So yeah. it's okay. It's a messy process. Yeah. And I think We're, I was going to say there's those situations sometimes when you realize I've made a terrible mistake, like you're in a restaurant. You tried to take the one-year-old that just learned how to walk. It's a longer dinner with grandma or something. And they're just, by minute 45, they're just so desperate to get out of the high chair. And you realize, oh, this this probably wasn't a good expectation that they would sit in the high chair for over an hour. And, you know, they're melting down and you realize, wow, I've made a terrible mistake. You, you sound like you're speaking from experience. <laughs> Did you make that mistake once? We have made that mistake. Oh, so we we've had to take turns. I just, I you probably blocked it out of your memory. But, you know, we've had to take turns where you take the toddler outside the restaurant and you let him walk around. You know, this is this is the healthy expectation I'm talking about. Now, the five year old should be able to sit through a dinner with grandma and color or do something, but you know, and be okay. So it's those sorts of things that you do just sometimes learn from mistakes. And also too, I think having other families around you whose kids are older that you can say, you know, is my kid, is this unusual or is this normal for a two-year-old? And you know, a wise mother or father will say, oh, <laughs> You know, this is normal or, oh, no, you know, that this is something they can stop doing. or Yeah, that you know. I that was going to be one of, I think, the second thing I was going to say, which just shows how in sync we are here, <laughs> uh, is that look for examples, look for models of people who you think do this well, who when you see someone and their kids are well behaved and you're like, oh, gosh, I'd love for my my kids to be that way. Don't be tempted to think, oh, they just got lucky. You know, I, I, I hear you hear that from from parents. It's almost like they think well-behaved kids was accidental or they were just born that way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my kids will never be that way. No, go spend time with those parents. Spend time with those families and hang out and see what they do. Mm -hmm. And so you can learn through those models. And then I think another way to develop healthy expectations is really do your, do your theology. You know, go to scripture. If, if you as a parent spent just, you know, uh, a, a study of just taking every verse in scripture that talks about child raising or discipline or parenting, put those all down, or even just did a study of the Proverbs, everything the, the, the proverb says about discipline, and then looked at it and read through it and tried to pull out the implications, that would help then shape your expectations. So for instance, Ephesians chapter six says, children obey your parents. Well, I think one of the implications of that command is that children can obey their parents, mm -hmm. that this is something that's possible. It's reasonable to think that your kids can be obedient. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I think all that to say, first step that helps us to really, you know, see discipline as training is have reasonable expectations. And then secondly, you were saying. Yeah, is, is to know your unique child or children. You know, we, we have five. So um, knowing them uniquely is helpful in, the training and habit forming that we need to do with them. Because of course, at, like with each of us, they, they have their strengths and their weaknesses. And so, you know, in their weaknesses, we really need to help nurture and push them sometimes. And this is part of the overall discipline. So one example I think of, uh, a lot is how, um, one of our kids, we have extroverted kids and introverted kids. Well, one out of the five was extremely shy when she was little. And uh oh, you just narrowed it down. 
You just well, that we have three girls, so it could be one of the three. Okay. I know. I don't it's know hard if she's going to gonna be happy about that. <laughs> she better not listen to this podcast. So one of the three girls was extremely shy. And this came out again so early. So she was six months old in the cart at Target. And a sweet lady came up and said, oh, she is so cute. And she just looked at her and gave and like kind of moved away from her and had like this rude look on her face. And I was like, oh, my gosh, my baby's rude. And <laughs> I was horrified because, you know, with as you know, I, with the kids, I'm, I'm big on you're polite to adults. You know, you say hi. No, she's six months. So I'm not expecting her to say hi. But I was like, oh, my gosh, she was rude. And she's only a baby. And of course, as she got older, I can see she's very shy. So she would stick to my leg, you know, when we're at church and people would talk to her. She'd like talk to her. She would back. not answer. So why am I giving this example? So it's important for me that my children are respectful to adults. Right. And just friendly to people. So I know this thing about her. And so it's not it's not a discipline issue in that she's being naughty. It's rebellious. That, it, rebellious. Not naughty. I just want to translate. That's the, <laughs> the mommy word is naughty. And that means rebellious, right? Sometimes and you use these mommy words all the time. Like you'll say to our 19 year old, do you need to go potty? <laughs> I do And I'm not. like, hey, no, you go to the bathroom. Oh go my bathroom. gosh. I've stopped saying that. Oh, okay. All okay. Right. So what was I saying? Come so it's not just she's being naughty okay. or okay, rebellious. Okay, so, so. So when she was, you know, three or four, I realized what was really helpful with her is before we would go to a social situation, for example, meeting friends at a park or going over to someone's house, we would pull up and I would say, okay, honey, we're going to go inside. And when we get inside, go up and, you know, they're going to say hi. And you just, you say hi. You need to at least look them in the eye and say hi. Hi. You can be right next to me. You don't have to say a lot more. You know, just at least greet them, though. And then you can stay right by me. I will be with you. But you've got to do that, okay? And because there had been times where we had gotten somewhere, so again, I'm learning from mistakes. We had gotten somewhere, someone saying hi to her, and she's not responding at all. And I'm embarrassed and feeling like, oh, she's being so rude. But it, she wasn't being, she wasn't meaning to be rude. She was just terrified in those situations. So the more I got to know her, I could set her up to do well in those situations, but not have these expectations that she's going to be like our youngest son who says hi to everyone we pass on the street, random people in the store, you know. Yeah, his and, and knowing his unique personality, there's some op opposite instruction. Like yeah. you can't wander away and go talk to anyone <laughs> that you want to talk to yeah. when we go to the grocery store. Yeah, actually with him, we have to sometimes say, hey, when we go in this place, you're actually going to need to be quiet, you know. <laughs> and so setting him up and knowing him well has set him up for times where I've said, now remember, I told you, you need to be quiet in here or whatever. So knowing these things about our kids can help us not to have, you know, sometimes real frustrating situations, which I think is important. And also, what were you going to say? Well, I think you're probably going where I was going to go. You go first, ladies first. <laughs> well, so knowing knowing them well, too, helps us to know what will get their attention when we're trying to correct them. Exactly. So the the phrase that I'll use a lot when I'm teaching, uh, you know, at a young mom's group or something, I'll say we have to know what they love so that we can take it away. You are mean. <laughs> Sounds like the meanest mother ever. <laughs> it does sound no, just, terrible. Well, but but if, there's if that context is training to correct. Yes. And it's done with love, right? Because you want your kids to to love God mm -hmm. and to love other people. Yeah. Then something like that isn't unloving. Mm -hmm. It's and this is where because this is because I'm thinking to modern ears. This is where it's so important to, to think about how the culture influences us and how culture influences our views about, mm -hmm. about discipline and undermines us, where some people might think, oh, that sounds 
meaning. I know. And I know you you say it to kind of get some attention, <laughs> but it is it, it it's actually an effective way to bring in one aspect of discipline, and that's the punishment aspect, mm-hmm. knowing what um, will be effective in terms of correcting s- certain bad behavior. Yeah. So I just want to affirm you. You can go on with, you know, taking away <laughs> you stuff You want to call love. me mean and then affirm me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had um, to get the sarcasm in there. Yes, because when we're, when we're teaching correction, thankfully, sometimes you can just correct them and they'll do it. <laughs> but... For, of course, we know human nature, so we know that, that oftentimes there's going to need to be, sometimes to get our attention, there needs to be some pain. And I'm not talking about physical pain, although sometimes it can get to that, but physical pain does get our attention. But um, pain as far as we want this thing and now we don't get to have it because of a consequence of something we've done. So it's it's as simple as the toddler in the car screaming saying they want their pacifier or their blanket or something, or maybe they have their pacifier and blanket, you know they love it, they're throwing a fit about something, you now take away the blanket and pacifier. Now, I have done this with our children. So I've taken it away. And then they, they're they like, <gasps> they've lost their best buddies, right? And so I'll say, do you want your blanket? And we called it a nookie, <laughs> but their pacifier. Do you want your pacifier and blanket back? you know, yes. Okay. Then you need to calm down and stop screaming and okay. Stop screaming. As soon as you stop screaming, you can have these back, but not, not when you're acting like this, you know? And so you know, these things about them that they love. And so you take it away and it goes all the way up to like a teenager. And, and one of our girls, when, (laughs) when she was in eighth or ninth grade, um, she got in trouble. I think she got caught in a lie or something. And I came in her room and said, okay, hand me your phone. Um, we're taking your phone away, you know, for the rest of the week. And then tear, mom, why? Every time I get in trouble, the first thing you take is the cell phone. And I said, of course, because you love it. <laughs> And she was, of course, horrified that I said that. But this is what got her attention. It's like, what I couldn't take the TV away. She didn't care about TV. You know, I couldn't take um, something, something else away that she didn't care about. It wouldn't get her attention. When I took her phone, now we're bringing, now we're bringing in red flags like, oh, hey, this is actually a big deal. So knowing our kids that way is really helpful. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, and this is where knowing their personalities, yes. you know, the in, so the our introverted kids, if we stick them in time out, <laughs> they're like, thank you, mom and dad. <laughs> thank It was like, almost like a reward. Especially you know? in this crazy house with seven people, if you get time alone as an introvert, you're thankful. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> but then you take the extrovert, let's just take the youngest, uh, nine-year-old Jonah, you put him in timeout, you isolate him from other human beings. And, oh, that is like the worst punishment. In fact, what was it? How old was he? He was like think, four or five years old. I think he was only three. And, and he was put in timeout in his bed <laughs> and we had him go lay in his bed and we could hear him, you know, <laughs> sobbing and, you know, crying, crying out, out to, to the, the Lord. Lord. <laughs> He was saying, oh, God, why am I act so naughty? And I mean, just going on. I mean, you would have thought he had done the worst offense and that we had told him, you know, we're we're not going to see you for a week or so. I mean, he had been in there for 30 seconds or a minute. even. But that's just how (laughs) extroverted and people oriented he is. So. All right. So understanding our children, their own unique personalities will help us in the the correction process. So I just want to end that by saying. So we knew timeouts were effective with Jonah. It got his attention to where timeouts with our introverted kids, at least that kind of thing, didn't didn't work. So we had to figure something else out to get their attention. And that's a healthy child, uh, uh, I guess the child-centered approach, because sometimes you hear about a child-centered approach where it's kind of everything is centered around the child and that where there's half truths in that. And, it's and a, this is the child, aspect of it that that's healthy. Yeah, it's a child respecting approach, I think. I think, you know, the things we're talking about, reasonable expectations, understanding your kids is actually that 
respect that we're supposed to give our kids just as hum- as unique human beings yeah. made by God. That's, I think, a better a better term for it. Mm-hmm. It's not child-centered. It's child-respectful. Re- yeah. Um, okay, so two more here okay. that are... And again, these are helping us to br- to approach discipline as correction, not just punishment. But the third one is just um, responding appropriately mm-hmm. to certain situations. Yeah. So I, I think this one, it kind of is what I was talking about earlier with, okay, for, for example, the toddler who's who constantly makes messes, like they just get, especially when they start walking, for example, you know, your kid starts walking, they get into everything, they make a mess everywhere, they do things they're not supposed to do, they start climbing on everything. Um, and so we understand they're curious, so we don't respond to those situations with, you know, anger or thinking they're, you know, I, they're doing something to be disobedient. Um, to be naughty. To be. See, I didn't use it and now you're you're still getting on me. But anyway, so, yeah, it's it's that. So sometimes they're just curious. Sometimes kids do things. And this is why when parents say to them, like, why did you do that? They're, they have no idea how to answer you to that because it's, it's impulse driven, you know, they're, so sometimes kids just do things out of impulse. It's like the ball flew in the street. So of course they went to go get it. You know, they weren't thinking, oh, a car could become, you know, and as parents will freak out. And so sometimes that's not a discipline issue as much as it's just a kid issue and they just don't know. And they need our protection, obviously. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that we've Uh, In terms of the more serious punishments, Mm -hmm. we've always said, let's try to distinguish as best we can, all right, what is, what seems to be uh, maybe some disobedience, or what's what's, kind of childlike irresponsibility? What is disobedience, but maybe it's not... um, as as intentional or in your face or whatever. Like and then, deliberate. Yeah. And, and then what is like outright rebellion? Like mm-hmm. that is you you just kind of looked at us and said, you know. Yeah. Yeah, because there's those confrontational issues that they're basically saying to you, Am I in charge or are you in charge? You know, there there are those things where they're like, no, I'm not doing that. And they're really testing you to see if you're going to make them do something they don't want to do is different from, you know, a curiosity issue or another issue, I think, too, of just they feel upset and they don't know how to express it. And so they'll maybe they'll hit or they'll throw a tantrum or something like that. And sometimes, especially initially when they're little, these are just the outworkings of their frustration and they don't know how to express it. And so... If they're just, if you can tell they're frustrated, their brother just got them frustrated and, and so they, you know, they do something. So you correct them. You do not hit, you do not throw this, but are you frustrated right now? I can, you seem like you're really frustrated, you know, and that's not as much of a saying, you know, I'm in charge around here as much as it's, they have, they don't have any tools yet to know how to handle their their big emotions that they feel. Yeah, when you say something like that, and, and, and actually when it comes to our second point as well of understanding and knowing your child, mm-hmm. I mean, what this speaks to or what's required is that we are students of our kids, mm-hmm. that uh, we, we have to sit back and pause and um, spend time getting to know our kids, uh, uh, thinking through their uniqueness, being being students of our students, being students of our children, and trying to gain knowledge about them uh, as we watch. And so being observant, watching them in different situations, so that as we know them better, we can respond more appropriately to those things. Yeah, I think um, knowing them is is so valuable. And that's where as parents, we can work together on that. Sometimes I'll notice things about the kids and I'll talk to you or you'll say, 
oh, when this happened today, I noticed, you know, that she really got upset by this or whatever. And so it can, that's where that information's, you know, we need to work together on that. Yeah. Too. And, you know, so if you're a mom and a dad, you know, you got to be allies on this. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I, there are so many times when you have said things or you've made an observation about a kid and what they did or, or how they responded that have kind of been these aha moments for me in saying, ah, I wouldn't have even thought of it that way. Mm-hmm. And hopefully vice versa. I'm trying to think. But I'm whatever. Sure. whatever. <laughs> you're having an aha moment right now. Um, but if you're a single parent still needing that, it's, it's, it is, it's more difficult, of mm-hmm. course. But then saying, hey, can grandma and grandpa give some input? What are their observations? Or a close friend. Mm-hmm. And so having those allies. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's do the, the, the fourth one here and, and wrap this up. Um, and yeah. this is this the fourth one is this idea of kind of highlighting and reinforcing good behavior. Mm-hmm. Again, it's not just punishing bad behavior. Discipline is not just about that. But how do we highlight, celebrate uh, obedience? Yeah. Yeah. When they're actually doing the habits that we want them to do, not to forget to praise them for doing that. And this is, this is difficult as parents. I mean, maybe initially when they do something the first time you're like, Oh, thank you for doing that or something. But then we forget because they're doing things that they're supposed to do. And so we forget to sometimes just affirm them for, Hey, I saw that you helped your sister out of the car. That was really sweet of you to do. And it's exactly what mommy's talking about when I say, you know, that we got to love each other as a family. You know, it's noticing the things and actually praising them for that and not just being the parents that are every day just focusing on the bad. You messed up in this again. You did this again. You did that again. And instead pointing out the good that they are doing. Yeah. And, and that is a challenge because sometimes, like I, I know for me, you you want to create a high expectation for kids. And so the expectation is obedience. Expectation is respect. You know, expectation are these things. So if you do them, well, that, that's, that's to be expected. And so uh, I have to be more intentional to praise the good for sure. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and when we do that, there is, it, it, it's, I, I get, there's, um, there's, there's a different kind of incentive there mm-hmm. for rather than just avoiding the, you know, the punishment for a kid. There's also this sense of, oh, there's there's goodness to this. And there's a kind of a, a, a mini celebration, if you will, from the, the parents and a praise mm-hmm. and an affirmation that's just good for a child's heart. Yeah, I think there's a, a healthy sense of pride when, you know, when you're affirmed for something good. You feel a healthy sense of pride, I think, especially as kids of like, oh, yeah, this is what I'm this is what I'm supposed to do. And it feels good to do that. And mom and dad actually notice. So that always feels good. And yeah, I think probably we would say this, you know, we weren't always we haven't been great at doing this. We're you I mean, because it's just easier to notice the mess ups than it is to notice when everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's, you know, Aaron, I just want to affirm you. That's a really good point. <laughs> I'm, just going, okay. I'm trying to put what so, we're teaching into practice. Okay, so so one, one thing that I thought of with this is, um, again, a story of our son Micah. But when he was, I think, 11, he was reading um, Tim Tebow's book. And Tim Tebow's that football player and um, or former football player. Former NFL former player. Former NFL player. And a really played strong Den- Christian. Played for the Denver Broncos, which is a team that we really dislike. <laughs> and in fact, Tim Tebow, uh, he actually beat the Steelers in the playoffs with this overtime touchdown through that he got lucky on. So a good guy, but just don't like him as a football <laughs> player. Just want to make that clear because we so are Pittsburgh Steelers fans. He is a good guy. And... um so Micah was reading his autobiography that he wrote. So one one night I'm in the kitchen cooking dinner and Micah comes joining out and he says, Mom, you'll never believe what the Tebow family does. Can we, I want to do what, what his mom did. And I said, okay, what is it? And he said, so Mrs. Tebow 
when so they had they actually had five kids like us and he said when they were out in public that her kids if they got a compliment on their character from a stranger she would pay them a dollar and so Micah told me, you know, the example was like Tim would be holding open a door for someone and they'd walk in and they'd say, oh, thank you. That was so kind. And so that's a compliment on his character. And if things like that happened out in public, then the kids would earn a dollar. So Micah said, Mom, can we do that? And so I said, sure, you know, because we always wanted to focus on character qualities more than, and I mean, it was like a week later and we were out to lunch with my grandma, their great grandma, and Micah and Paige were helping grandma get in the car. She had a walker at the time. So, um, they walk her to her side of the door. They open the door. Micah takes the walker. Paige helps her in. Micah puts the walker in the trunk. And then I was getting the little ones in the car. Anyway, we didn't notice, but there was a guy parked next to us watching the kids do all this. And he rolled down his window and he starts to pull away, but he says, hey, you guys. And then he goes, I was watching you with your grandma. You know what? You guys are awesome. You are so sweet to your grandma. You guys are awesome. And he was just so enthusiastic. And Mike and Paige were just like, oh, thank you, you know. And he drove away. And then they both slowly turned <laughs> and smiled at me. And it's and as if you could see dollar, dollar signs, signs in their in eyeballs. Their, in their eyes. But I was like, okay, yes, you know, you you earned a dollar. But that was that was what the Tebos did. And I we thought it was a cool um you know, kind of family practice. To well, do. It, it helped us with that, uh, with, with highlighting the yeah. good. It, it was a way to kind of help remind us, oh, hey, they got <laughs> caught doing something good. Yeah. And yeah. Um, now sometimes w with with this, you know, highlighting the good or, uh, or motivating or incentivizing, we talk about uh, rewards, mm -hmm. right? And now this yeah. is a different kind of reward versus the star sticker kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. There's lots of products out there and philosophies that will say, incentivize your children to do good. Um, by giving rewards, giving we rewards, re doing rewards a chart. Yeah. Doing a chart with stars or doing a jars where they earn balls. You know, we've done, we have done different things. Well, like and that. to clarify the, the, like the little balls after they get to a certain amount. Yeah. It, like it you, wasn't like the little fluffy ball itself was a reward. <laughs> like, yes. yay. No, no, was, no. They get to the top of the jar and then they get, you know, they get to, yeah. uh, a, a prize out of the whatever prize basket or something. Yeah. Like so it was, you know, all these different things of basically earning a, a reward. Some prize, some reward, mm -hmm. some, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we have, we've tried different things over the years. As I said, we've been parents for a while. So we've um, tried and failed at different things. This, this idea of rewards is one that I have struggled with. And, and when we were talking about this episode, we were kind of going back and forth. So anyways, I one, one woman I've learned a lot on this topic of is Charlotte Mason, who was a uh, late 19th century, early 20th century English educator. And she was against rewarding kids for good, for good behavior, good behavior, for incentivizing them to do things that they ought to do is basically, you know, how she would say it because she talked about training their will and, and that you don't want to want to give these rewards and basically train them to expect rewards all the time. And I think she's right about it. I really do. I think there's a difference from like accomplishing something hard and celebrating, you know, like I think about like after the choir concert our kids had the other night, you know, and they worked hard for it all year. And then, and then we went out to frozen yogurt, you know, that that's a celebration. I think that's different than, you know, you get an M&M &M every time you go and make your bed or, or you, you know, these kinds of things where you're in like, in, it's kind of like holding the carrot out for the kid to do, to do these things. But do you, <clears throat> so as we wrestle through this and maybe even disagree a little bit here, mm -hmm. um, you, are you saying that, and is Charlotte Mason saying never do rewards? 
never give a positive incentive like that. Because it seems to me that I, I get why you wouldn't want to over incentivize. Like every time you do the thing that you ought to, here's the, you know, here's the piece of candy or something like that. I can see how that could undermine uh, discipline. But it seems like given fallen human nature, that the, the incentives, the, the negative and positive incentives play a role. And you think about that even as adults, mm -hmm. right? There are, I, I'm, in, I'm incentivized as a man to develop certain character traits, to develop selflessness, to develop a, hard, you know, a, a strong work ethic. There's incentives like making money, being able to take care of my family, uh, things like that. Or, you know, you just think about uh, a business owner is incentivized to serve his customers well. So there's, there's, you know, they're, they're, you're, you're incentivized to be virtuous. Mm -hmm. So it seems like we could say, hey, there is a place for rewards, but it's got, it, but it might take a, a smaller role than, than punishment as well. Um, it may, there, there's a, maybe a certain emphasis on it. Uh, and eventually, and maybe it maybe the rewards plays a bigger role when they're younger because we're going to still we're going to talk about some different stages to think about in terms of of discipline, but maybe it plays a, a bigger role earlier. But ultimately, where then you want them to get to a point of maturity where the 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 obedience or the the goodness. The, the, the good moral action itself turns out to be a reward as, as well. So it's not this carrot out there, okay, I did this, now I get this, but oh no, the thing itself of being unselfish is a reward in itself mm -hmm. based upon how I'm designed. And Well, okay, so I won't, I don't want to speak for Charlotte Mason, but yeah, I have read a ton of her. She's not alive right hers. now. So... <laughs> so I, I don't want to come off as as an authority on her because there are people who are authorities, so I don't want to misspeak. But I think what Charlotte Mason would talk about, and I think what I'm convinced of too, is that what you just described for the adult is something that children can actually experience too. Like the joy of being unselfish, a child can experience that too. And they don't need these silly little incentives to do the good. Well, and not all incentives do, are silly though, right? Well, yeah. okay. I'm talking about like a sticker chart or, you know, something like that. That's what are I Or even, do. would you think, would you say that's silly all the time? A sticker chart? Yeah. I'm just thinking of the mom who does a sticker chart right now who's listening, <laughs> who just was insulted. Okay, I've already just no, said just that we've done ball jars and we've done all kinds of stuff. So, um, so I think... I think the the point is incentivizing them to do the good that if it if it really is a good that the reward of doing good is 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 in itself. But doesn't that have that appetite have to be developed over time? Like I I think you I think you're right a kid a young kid could experience some of that but it, the appetite for that develops over time and the kind of the desires and affections are trained to head in that direction more. So, yeah, I think it would just, it's, I, I, I see what you're saying. I just think that it's okay. So when does it stop? You know, cause that I've had a lot of moms say, okay, so I did an M&M &M every time they did something. And then now I don't know when to stop because it's like, it's getting out of hand. Yeah. And so now that's their part teeth are rotting out. <laughs> so <laughs> that is part of the problem. Like when do the, in, when do the incentives start? Once you start them, when does it st stop? So I, I, I think, I think that's something to think about like, okay, so now you've created this habit. And so not that you can't break it because we have, we've done these things and we've broken the habit. So I'm not saying you can't, but Anyways, I think, um, and, and I do want to distinguish between doing work and getting a reward for yes, work. We're so for about example, moral, moral yeah, development or, or doing what they yeah are what? supposed to do or ought to do, yeah. or, you know, doing things that are good, um, is different from like, we've done chore charts 
and still do chore charts where the kids mark off their chores and then they get paid at the end of the week for doing that's different because uh, I'm talking about like work. And so there's that kind of incentives. Of course, as adults, we need incentives to go to work. If, if you're not going to get paid, you know, you're not going to go to work and these sorts of things. So, um, so we might just, you know, disagree on it, but we definitely have moved away as a family from incentives. We used to do it a lot more. And I don't know if it was really that effective. And, and yeah, and then just the more I keep learning and growing, I think, you know, I, I, I don't know if I would have done some of the stuff we did before. Yeah. Well, I think it's, this is good. Hopefully you can see Aaron and I wrestling, even, you know, continuing to wrestle through some of this Mm -hmm. stuff. I think, uh, a couple of things when it comes to incentives, there is a sense where I think we would, uh, we would say the, the, the act itself and the fruit from that ends up being this incentive. Mm -hmm. So there, there are even, even if you don't hold to the reward sticker chart, you know, kind of thing, Mm -hmm. we're not saying you're not incentivized. I mean, there is a, there is an incentive. What, what is that incentive is, is, is the question or, or what's the best kind of incentive. But then also, um, shoot, I had another, (laughs) I had another thought. It was so good and so deep and so rich and so significant. (laughs) And I can't remember what it was, but it was about incentives. Um, I, Oh gosh. Well, we'll think of it for the next podcast because it was good. It was, it was a thought I had about incentives. Well, just wait for a minute. And well, I don't want those people out there listening right now to just sit there in <laughs> silence while, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> no, it was, uh, but I, I think the, the key point I wanted to highlight was no, there, there still are incentives, but sometimes it's, it's the goodness that results for it. Oh no, I know what I was thinking here. I was thinking it, it's, it's helpful to narrate the incentive that comes naturally mm-hmm. from the good action. Mm-hmm. So for instance, hey, when when you uh, obey mommy or daddy's rule on this, uh, one of the really good things that that does is it it creates this, this peace between mom and dad. It doesn't create conflict. It doesn't create this turmoil or this frustration. Mm-hmm. And, and to live together in harmony or whatever words you use for a young child to, to, to not have that is, isn't that good? You know, and, and I think narrating that kind of stuff. is Yeah. I, I think uh, I thought of an example of like, you know, when, when you're, you're teaching them to share and then when you go to someone's house and they share with your kid and then you can say later, didn't it feel good that they shared with you? Yeah. That, that it feels really good when someone shares with you. That's why that's why we talk to you about sharing and that's why we make you share with your brothers and sisters or you know whatever. And and just that getting them to see there's there's just benefit of living in community and when we care for one another we all benefit from that. Okay, wow. You and I talked a lot more than we anticipated on this episode. But I think I think all those things are good, and we're getting more and more practical. <laughs> um, some people are still thinking, uh, okay, uh, what do I do when my two-year-old throws a tantrum? Well, we're going to get to that in the next podcast, because we are going to focus on really that first stage of moral development. And, uh, and hopefully, I think, hopefully... We'll, we can wrap this series up in the next two podcasts. <laughs> I'm not going to promise anything. We'll probably, it'll probably be seven more, <laughs> but we are just getting more and more practical. I think tonight's uh, stuff or today's, ep- today, t- <laughs> <laughs> that's easy for you to say. Um, this episode <laughs> right here, we've just talked too much already. Um, this episode right here is getting us is this is some practical stuff mm-hmm. to start with. Yeah. And then we'll get to all right, what do I do in my We'll break my, down the ages next. Yeah, and what do I do with the tantrum? And what do I do with the kid that says no? And what do I do with the kid that hits me and you know What do I do with the teenager? And yeah, teenager just generally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in the next 2 3 4 7 episodes, we will <laughs> really even get more practical on some very very uh 
detailed, specific, specific age specific how tos. So that's coming up. All right, that's enough for discipline right now. <laughs> Maven exists to help the next generation know truth, pursue goodness, and create beauty for the cause of Christ. To find out more, check out maventruth.com.